Matthew chapter 1. We'll begin reading in just a moment in verse 18. It was just a few days before Christmas, and two ladies were standing outside of a mall store, and they noticed in the window a large nativity scene. And there were these clay figures of Jesus and Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, and there were even some wise men. And one of the ladies turned to the other one and said, look at that. There goes the church again trying to horn in on Christmas. And then, unfortunately, that's where we've come. The world has co-opted Christmas from the church, and we've gotten to the point now in our society where people don't want Jesus to have anything at all to do with Christmas. They want Him, all, they want him out altogether. They don't want nativity scenes. They don't want Christmas carols that mention Jesus. They don't even want to say the words Merry Christmas anymore. Just Happy Holidays. This past week in Montgomery County, Maryland, the school board voted to strip all religious holidays from the school calendar because the Muslim community wanted equal time off for all Muslim holidays. The Maryland Outreach Manager for the Council on American Islamic Relations, Zanab Chowdhury, said, and I quote, there have been efforts underway for over a decade by the local Muslim communities to have the EID holidays added to the school calendar. Unfortunately, their efforts have been met with a lot of resistance. We're not seeking special rights for these students. We're seeking equal rights, end quote. Sound familiar? Equal rights. Islamic scholar Dr. Zakir Naik said, and I quote, saying Merry Christmas is worse than fornication or killing someone, end quote. Equal rights. Zainab Chowdhury also said, and I quote, parents of Muslim children feel as if their children are being treated as second-class citizens, end quote. No, Ms. Chowdhury, they're not being treated like second-class citizens. They're being treated like every other citizen of this country called the United States of America, which was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. But the war is on, ladies and gentlemen. It's on. To get Christ out of Christmas, to make Christmas just another secular holiday like, like, like Valentine's Day or President's Day where there's, well, it's just meaningless. But there's something about Christmas that makes it different than every other holiday. I and mean, if you try to take Christ out of Christmas, you rip the heart and soul out of the celebration altogether. I mean, you can't even have the word Christmas without Christ. And if Christmas isn't the celebration of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, what on earth are we celebrating? Now, I get it that we don't know the exact date of Jesus' birth. I get that. But this is the date that we do celebrate His birth. I understand that Santa Claus has nothing to do with Christianity. <clears throat> In fact, some people say that Santa is just Satan spelled a different way. I think that's a little extreme. I understand mistletoe and holly and yule logs and ivy were all ancient pagan symbols. I get all that. I understand that fruitcakes are for nutcases and eggnog is, well, I won't even go there. The point is, the world may not understand it or may not want anything to do with Chris, Christmas and Christ. But for you and I, it's got to be altogether different. Christmas should be a big deal to us, and our celebration should be all about Christ. We should celebrate Christ's birth in such a way that we honor Christ so others can't help but notice, because we focus on the reason why Christ was born. And trees and wreaths and carols that we sing, everything that we do should, should focus on Jesus. Even the exchange of gifts between family and friends, they're meaningless if they don't point 
to the person and the work of Christ. The truth is, all around the world, at least for now, people are celebrating Christmas. And Paul said in Ephesians 5.16, we should make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The day's probably going to come when you can't celebrate Christmas in America. So, oh, no, that'll never happen. Oh, Listen, friend, it's already happening. I just received word before this service that two little children of one of our preachers in Kabul, Afghanistan, working under the ministry of CICM with Dr. Ajay Law, were murdered. Why? For their faith. To stop them teaching about Jesus. They had just received their training at CICM headquarters in Delhi, India, and went to serve. There's a war on. And instead of backing away from Christmas, Christians ought to embrace it and celebrate the very heart of it, the very heart of Christmas, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians ought to make a big deal out of Christmas, especially the next several weeks. And and, and what I want to do is I want to share with you just a few reasons why Christmas ought to be a big deal to us. And I want to begin with number one, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word this morning? Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. One of the greatest reasons why Christmas ought to be a big deal, and it is a big deal, is because of the virgin birth. Dr. James Merritt said, and I quote, the world celebrates a season, but the Christian celebrates a Savior. Whether this world likes it or not, and increasingly the world doesn't like it, Christmas is the celebration of the birthday of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are some people who will be so drunk, they will not know whose birthday it is. There are some people who are so devious, they will want to forget whose birthday it is. And there are some people who are so depressed at this time of year, they don't care whose birthday it is, end quote. Dr. Adrian Rogers said, and I quote, some years ago, an American astronaut climbed down a ladder and put his feet on the surface of the moon. And the President of the United States of America said, the greatest event in human history is when man put his feet first upon the moon. All due respect to that President, Dr. Rogers said, the greatest event in human history was not when man first put his feet upon the moon, but when Almighty God came down and walked upon this earth. That, my dear friend, is the greatest event in human history. When God stepped out of heaven and came to earth, We call that the incarnation. We call that Christmas morning, end quote. Isaiah 9, 6 proclaims, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The world might try to ignore the birth of Jesus, but the fact is his birth changed everything. It is actually the dividing line in all of human history. Every date in history dates from the birth of Jesus Christ. Things that happened before His birth are 
said to be B.C., before Christ. After that, A.D., which is Latin for the year of our Lord. It all revolves around Jesus. And everything in Christianity revolves around Jesus as well and His supernatural virgin birth. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, the first announcement of Christ was that He would be the offspring of a woman. Now, while that doesn't explicitly exclude a male parent, it is significant that a male parent is not mentioned there. Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah said, therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Now, here's what's significant about that. Isaiah made that prediction, wrote those words 700 years before Jesus was born. And not just that Jesus would be born, but that He would be born of a virgin. Now, you do realize how hard that would be to fake. 700 years prior, not just a birth. By the way, the Bible didn't just, the, the, the Bible prophecies didn't just predict a birth. They predict where it would take place in a town called Bethlehem. Matthew 1.18 says, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was, be, was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now, I know someone might say, well, you know, what's the big deal about the virgin birth? I mean, so what? He was born, well, I mean, why is it so important that it be virgin birth? Oh, it's a big deal. Because you see, without the virgin birth, Jesus would not be God. And if Jesus is not God, then all He said, all He taught, everything He lived and everything He promised is nothing but a fraud. All of it. Think about it. If there's no virgin birth and Jesus is not God, what does that do to the Ten Commandments? Or what about the Sermon on the Mount? That's just a nice speech. No. If there's no virgin birth and Jesus is not God, what does that do to His death, burial, and resurrection? What does that do to our hope of salvation? If there's no virgin birth for that matter, what does that do to the validity of Scriptures? Or how about the necessity of the church? If there was no virgin birth, friend, I want to tell you something, we'd just all go home. It'd be a complete waste of time. If there's no virgin birth, there'd be no promise of eternal life. And what about any other promise in the Bible? Forget it. If there was no virgin birth and Jesus is not God, what would that do to our lives and our world and our future and our hope? It'd all be gone. You see, that's why other religions and infidels fight so hard to remove nativity scenes at Christmas. That's why the liberal theologians ignore it and deny it and attempt to dismiss it as being irrelevant. You know, we were in Israel several weeks ago, and we're going back next year, and we'll say more about that in the weeks to come, but we were in this shop, and and, and there was all kinds of phenomenal uh, woodworking things, and, 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 and there were nativity scenes everywhere. I mean, it is Israel. And, um, and in fact, we were in Bethlehem, where, where the shop was, and, and they had all these nativity scenes made, handmade out of wood, phenomenal, fantastic, some of them huge, some, some bigger than this pulpit. And, and as I looked through all these nativity scenes, I thought, you know, well, maybe we'll get one, bring it home and all that, but I couldn't find a price on any of them. So, so I walked up to the owner, who, who also speaks broken English, and I said to him, I said, excuse me, sir, I said, these nativity scenes, they're beautiful. They're very nice, aren't they? I said, yeah, they, they are. But, but I said, how do you know how much they are? And he said, lift Jesus up. You'll know the price. I said, okay. I lifted up the baby Jesus, and sure enough, there's the price. Now, maybe that's on purpose in that store. It's on point for sure. Because if you want to know the price, it's that baby in the manger. It's Jesus. And that's why if you're decorating your house or in the 
process of decorating your home for Christmas, the most important decoration you have is that nativity scene. You know, years ago, people didn't make a big deal about nativity scenes, but friends, I'm thinking it's about time we made a big deal about those nativity scenes. Because when the world says, no, you know, you don't, we don't want those. We don't want them at the school. We don't want them at the courthouse. and We don't want them in any public life. What they're saying is, we don't want Jesus. And friend, without Jesus, you just got a cheap little celebration that means nothing. You see, if the virgin birth is true, it changes everything. I mean, if the virgin birth is not true, that would mean the Scripture is unreliable and the Savior is undependable and our salvation is unattainable. But the virgin birth is true. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, Pastor, how do we know? How, how do, you know, I want to believe that, but how do we really know the virgin birth is true? Well, we have the testimony, first of all, of Scripture. Matthew 1, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets 700 years earlier. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, if the Bible is God-breathed, which the Bible tells us it is, and it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, then we can trust what the Bible says about the virgin birth. And the Bible says all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. But not just the testimony of Scripture. We have the testimony of Joseph. Look back at chapter 1, verse 19. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, the Bible says they were engaged to be married when the discovery was made. Verse 18. And when the discovery was made, Joseph, because of his love for Mary, he resolved he would divorce her quietly. He wasn't, I mean, it was going to be bad enough that she was having a child out of wedlock. In fact, according to Jewish law, she'd be stoned for that. And so he was going to quietly divorce her, and, and somehow maybe no one would notice. Jewish weddings had three stages. The contractual stage, that's when the parents decided who their kids were going to marry. Which, by the way, that might be a tradition we might want to bring back. I, you know, <laughs> parents have a say-so, you know. Then number two, there was the betrothal stage. That's where the two who had been chosen had come of age, and they, they would spend time together where all the family could watch. They didn't spend the night together. They didn't sleep together. There was none of that. They weren't allowed that. It was just a time to get to know one another. That's, that's the stage they were in when it, the news came she was with child. And then thirdly, there was the marriage stage when the bride and the groom would consummate their vows, usually after a week or two weeks or more of celebrations. Joseph knew Mary hadn't been with anybody else because he'd been the only one around her. He knew. And he knew there was no way on earth she could be pregnant by any man, least of all him. And Mary said, God, this, uh, um, God did this, Joseph. What, a, what an amazing afternoon or evening that must have been for him. You know, and people have said, well, you know, you know an angel appeared to him that night, you know, and, and, and I've been asked, do you, do you think it was a dream? Do you think it was a vision? And, 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 and I always said, well, you know, it was probably live because I don't think Joseph was asleep. It doesn't matter. He saw the angel, and the angel said, Joseph, listen, what Mary told you is true. God did this. We have the testimony of Joseph. We have, thirdly, the testimony of the angel. Verse 20 says, the angel of the Lord told Joseph specifically, what is conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. So Jesus had a, he had a supernatural birth. Never happened before, never happened since. 
even though there are other religions that have some kind of a form of some myth that they say, but there's no, there's no way to prove it. Jesus had an earthly mother, but not an earthly father. He had a heavenly father, but not a heavenly mother. He was the only baby ever born that was older than his mom, but and as old as his father. He had an earthly mother, so he would be human, but he had no human or earthly father, so he wouldn't be a sinner. And every man, listen to what I'm about to say here. Jesus was without human failure because he was without a human father. Pretty sobering. His birth was a miracle. It was supernatural. We also have the testimony of history. So what do you mean by that? Well, in chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, it says, When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. That's the historical record. The indisputable historical record. What Joseph did. And his response further tells us it was true. So what did Joseph do? Number one, he he believed the Word of God. He didn't just dump her and run on. He believed the Word of God. And by the way, if Joseph believed in the virgin birth, who else is qualified to not believe in it or say it's not true? Secondly, he did did the will of God. Whatever God told Joseph to do, he did it. There's nothing in Scripture about Joseph except he did what God told him to do. Boy, wouldn't that be great if if that was the record of history of your life and mine? Whatever God said to do, that's what we did. Thirdly, he honored the Son of God. Joseph honored Jesus by doing whatever he could for Jesus. And that's all we see about Joseph. We don't know anything else about him. Except he just, he was always honoring Jesus. I wonder what you could do for Jesus to honor him. I heard the story about a preacher who was preaching on Jesus and his virgin birth, and he was proclaiming with passion the truth of his conception by the Holy Spirit. And there was a man there that morning who came up after the service and said to him, I don't believe that story. And what's more, I don't believe that you believe it either pastor said, well, you are mistaken. I I do believe it. The man said, really? If a young girl came to your office this week who was six months pregnant, and she was with her boyfriend, and she said to you, "Uh, pastor, I'm expecting a baby. This is my boyfriend, the only man I've ever been with, and he's never touched me, and, and I conceived this baby miraculously by the Holy Spirit. Would you believe her? And he fully expected the pastor would say, well, of course not. No. But to his surprise, the pastor said, yes, I would believe it. And after a dramatic pause, he said, I would believe it if that birth had been foretold by prophets hundreds of years before that baby was born. I would believe it if an angel visited this boyfriend and said to him, do not be afraid to take this woman as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. I would believe it. If when that baby was born, wise men traveled from the east and brought gifts to worship him, and and a star guided them to, to the exact spot where the young child was, I would believe it if her son had grown up to have the power of over the wind and the waves and death and disease. I would believe it if her son died on a cross and was raised from the dead three days later. I would believe it if that son went out on a mountaintop and ascended visibly back into heaven while an angel stood by and said, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall also come again in like manner as you have seen him go. Yes, I would believe it, he said, if those who have followed him for some 2,000 years were numbered in the billions. Yes, not only would I believe it, I do believe it. And so do I. And so does every other objective, rational person who will examine the evidence. And that's why Christmas, my friends, is a big deal. And it ought to be a huge deal to every one of us who claims Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We ought to make a big deal out of it, and we ought to tell everyone else why it's such a big deal. You lift up Jesus. You'll know the prize. 
of it all. If we're going to make a big deal out of Christmas this year, a great place to begin is with the virgin birth. Let me give you three observations and I'm done. Number one, Jesus is the only person who has a birthday every year but never gets any older. Rats. Number two, even though it's his birthday, everyone gives gifts to everybody else but him. Which seems a little weird. Very weird, come to think of it. Number three, everybody ought to give a gift to him as we celebrate his birthday. You say, well, what do you, what do you give Jesus? You know, I've got a suggestion this morning. Maybe you ought to give Jesus the one thing he doesn't have yet. Your heart. Let's pray.